Oh, hello. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Ben's Book. Today we'll be looking at Fidelity by Wendell Berry. Five stories of love, adventure, and forgiveness. Turn to page 61 for a book called A Jean Keel for Mary Penn. That, that might not be pronounced that way. I'm sorry. I'm not very literate. <clears throat> Let's begin. Mary Penn was sick, though she said nothing about it when she heard Elton get up and light the lamp and renew the fires. He dressed and went out with the lantern to milk and feed and harness the team. It was early March, and she could hear the wind blowing, rattling things. She threw off the covers and sat on the side of the bed, feeling, as she did, how easy it would be to let her head lean down and get onto her knees, but she got up, put on her dress and sweater, and went to the kitchen. Nor did she mention it when Elton came back in, bringing the milk with the smell of the barn cold in his clothes. How are you this morning, he asked her, giving her a pat as she strained the milk. And she said, not looking at him, she did not want him to know how she felt. Just fine. He ate hungrily the eggs, sausage, and biscuits that she sat in front of him, twice emptying the glass that he replenished from a large pitcher of milk. She loved to watch him eat. There was something curiously delicate in the way he used his large hands, but this morning she busied herself around the kitchen, not looking at him, for she knew he was watching her. She had not even set a place for herself. You're not hungry, he asked. Not very. I'll eat something after a while. He put the sugar and cream in his coffee and stirred rapidly with the spoon. Now he lingered a little. He did not indulge himself often, but this was one of his moments of leisure. He gave himself to his pleasures as concentratedly as to his work. He was never partial about anything. He never felt two ways at the same time. It was, she thought, a kind of childishness in him. When he was happy, he was entirely happy, and he could be as entirely sad or angry. His glooms were the darkest she had ever seen. He worked as a hungry dog ate, and yet he could play at croquet or cards with the self-forgetful exuberance of a little boy. It was for his concentratedness, she supposed, if... Such a good thing could be supposed about that she loved him, and her yen just to look at him, for it was wonderful to her the way he was himself in his slightest look or guest gesture. She did not understand him in everything he did, and yet she recognized him in everything he did. She had not been prepared. She was hardly prepared yet for the assent she had given to him. Today, he might loiter a moment over his coffee. The day she knew had already possessed him, its momentum was on him. When he rose from bed in the morning, he stepped down to the day's work, impelled into it by the tension never apart from him between what he wanted to do and what he could do. The little hillside place that they had rented from his mother afforded him no proper scope for his ability and desire. They always needed money, but day by day they were getting by. Though the times were hard, they were not going to be in want. But she knew his need to surround her with a margin of pleasure and ease. This was his need, not hers. Still, when he was not working at home, he would be working or looking for work for pay. This morning, delaying his own plowing, he was going to help Walter Cotman plow his corn ground. She could feel the knowledge of what he was going to do tightening in him like a spring. She thought of him and Walter plowing, starting in the early light, and the two teams leaning into the college all day while the men walked in the opening furrows, and the steady wind shivering the dry grass shook the dead weeds and rattled the treetops in the woods. He stood and pushed his chair. She came to be hugged as she knew he wanted her to. It's me now, he said. Stay out. Stay in today. Take some care of yourself. You too, she said. You got on plenty of clothes. When I get them all on, I will. He was already wearing an extra shirt and a pair of overalls over his corduroys. Now he put on a sweater, his work jacket, his cap, and gloves. He started out the door and then turned back. 
Don't worry about the chores. I'll be back in time to do everything. All right, she said. He shut the door, and now the kitchen was a cell of still lamplight under the long wind that passed without inflection over the ridges. She cleared the table. She washed the few dishes he had dirtied and put them away. The kitchen contained the table and four chairs and the small dish cabinet that they had bought and the large iron cook stove that looked more permanent than the house. The stove, along with the bed and a few other sticks of furniture, had been there when they came. She heard Elton go by with the team, heading out the lane. The daylight would be coming now, though the window panes still reflected the lamplight. She took the broom from... Do I, how much time do I get? Like, is this just gonna cut off at some point and be like, your video's done. I don't know. Whatever. And swept and tidied up the room. They had been able to do nothing to improve the house, which had never been a good one, and had seen hard use. The wallpaper and probably the plaster behind had cracked in places. The finish had worn off the linoleum rugs near the doorways and around the stroves, but she kept the house clean. She made curtains. The curtains in the kitchens were of the same blue and white checkered gin can of the tablecloth. The bed stands were orange crates for which she had made skirts of the same cloth. Though the house was poor and hard to keep, she had made it neat and homey. Homey. <laughs> it was her first house, and usually it made her happy. But not now. She was sick. At first it was a consolation to her to have the whole day to herself to be sick in. But by the time she got the kitchen straightened up, even that small happiness had left her. She had a fever, she guessed, for every motion she made seemed to carry her uneasily beyond the vertical. She had a floaty feeling that made her unreal to herself, and finally, when she put the broom away, she let herself sag down into one of the chairs at the table. She ached. She was overpoweringly tired. She had rarely been sick, and never since she married. Now she did something else that was unlike her. She allowed herself to feel sorry for herself. She remembered that she and Elton had quarreled the night before. But what she could not remember, perhaps it was not rememberable, perhaps she did not know. She remembered the heavy, almost silent force of his anger. It had been only another of those tumultuous darkness that came over him as suddenly and sometimes as uncountably as a July storm. She was miserable, she told herself. She was sick and alone, and perhaps the sorrow that she felt for herself was not altogether unjustified. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> Continue. She and Elton had married a year and a half earlier when she was 17 and he 18. She had never seen anybody like him. He was a wild way of rejoicing, like a healthy child singing songs, joking, driving his old car as if he were drunk on the road, not wide enough. He could make her weak with laughing at him. And yet he was already a man, as few men were. He had been making his own living since he was 14 when he quit school. His father had been dead then for five years. He hated his stepfather. When a neighbor had offered him crop ground room and wages, he had taken charge of himself, and though he was still a boy, he had become a man. He wanted, he said, to have us to say thank you to nobody or to nobody but her. He would be glad, he said with a grin, to say thank you to her. He could do things. It was a wonderful what he would, could accomplish with those enormous hands of his. She could have put her hand into his and walked right off the edge of the world, which in a way is what she did. She had grown up in a substantial house on a good upland farm. Her family was not wealthy, but was an old family, proud of itself, always conscious of its position and of its responsibility to itself. She had known from childhood that she would be sent to college. Almost from childhood, she had understood that she was destined to be married to a solid professional man, a doctor perhaps, or, and this her mother particularly favored, perhaps a minister. And so when she married Elton, she did so without telling her family. She already knew their judgment of Elton. He's nothing. Quote. She and Elton simply drove down to...